All right, well, welcome everybody to Home Alone, the story of how working for a distributed company really works. Uh, my name's David Boyke, that's my Twitter, same as my name, easy to remember. Um, how many people like the movie Home Alone? Every, there's like one person's like, eh. Well, one, Home Alone is one of my favorite Christmas movies ever because it's the story of a disturbed preteen who's also an identity thief who commits like multiple violent felonies against two just, you know, hard working guys just trying to make a buck in a down economy. And then eventually the kid meets the future president of the United States of America. Um, not my favorite Christmas movie ever. That distinction would have to go to Die Hard, of course. But if my job really had anything to do with Die Hard, I would be in a lot of trouble. So I work, I, I don't work in a big office in a cube farm with a bunch of distractions. I don't work in the big, big skyscraper downtown. Uh, I work from home. Well, that's not my home, that's the Home Alone house. Hopefully you all know that. Uh, this is actually my house, or at least it was 25 days ago. Is there anyone local here who remembers this happening and uttered a few choice phrases when all this snow occurred? Um, Minnesota can get pretty snowy sometimes. Um, so this is, what I, this is where I work now. The, the benefit of working from home is I never ever have to commute. In fact, my commute is working, is stepping down a few steps into my basement, into my office, and then I'm there. This is actually, to come here, this is actually the first time I've commuted in the past three years, and I gotta tell you, it was awful. I absolutely hated it. So I work here in my house, in a little base, in the basement, it's actually like under that bush and down in the basement, all by myself. Well, no, I'm not all by myself. I've got my little puppy, Dylan. I still call her a puppy even though she's 11 years old, but because she's 11 years old, she you know, mostly sleeps all day and doesn't really do much. You know, she doesn't really pitch in or write any code or anything like that. Uh, she can be a good rubber duck though. Um, she's a slacker. Anyway, I work for Particular Software, and if you haven't heard of Particular Software before, we are the makers of a product called In Service Bus and a whole platform of tools that goes around that. And Service Bus is all about distributed messaging for creating distributed systems so that you don't have a big monolithic code base that's hard to version and ship and all that kind of stuff. And for the most part, working for particular software is pretty great. Generally awesome, although there are some drawbacks. On the plus side, I get to basically set my own schedule. I mean, we work all over the world, so eight to five, nine to five, it doesn't matter. I can put in my hours really whenever I want. Um, when the new Star Wars movie comes out, I can just decide, you know what, my wife doesn't want to go, so I'm just going to go in the middle of the day and I'll work that night instead. Um, I can eat whatever I want, although sometimes that's not such a good thing. It can be pretty tempting when there's a whole fridge full of food that's maybe not so good for me, just right upstairs. Um, but remember, I, you know, it's snowy and you get like pent in sometimes, so I do try to make a rule to at least once a week go out and eat, eat somewhere outside of the house just to get a change of scenery. Preferably meet someone for lunch. It kind of helps with you know, feeling like you're stuck in the house all day. Um, I get to listen to whatever music I want. In fact, uh, at a reasonable volume. In fact, I think that working from home actually might be saving my ears and my hearing, which is kind of important to me. Uh, you know, before when I was a consultant and I worked in one of those big offices, I would sit with my headphones on all day blaring my music probably louder than my mother would be comfortable with. But now I get to have the music on speakers that are on my desk and no more worry about my hearing. I can run an errand in the middle of the day or if someone needs to make a delivery to the house or come work in the house, I can let them in. We once had our dishwasher break and of course we wanted that fixed as soon as possible and it was really nice to be able to say, I work from home, I'm really flexible. You can deliver it at your earliest opportunity. If I need to do, it, if I need to do uh, a household chore in the middle of the day, I can do that too, although this is a bit of a trap. Uh, your significant other may say something like, well, you're home, why can't you stay on top of the laundry and unload the dishwasher and do this and do that? Well, because I'm working. Uh, I actually have eight hours of work to do each day and I don't, that doesn't change just because I'm working from home. So, it's really not just me, all of us work from home. This is uh, an image of one of our town hall meetings, I believe. Um, 
since we're all around the world, we don't all get on the same call all at the same time, but our meetings kind of rotate to be in different time zones at different times. I'm up there in the Star Trek shirt. This is probably the most dressed up you'll ever see me. Um, and so working from home is, <sighs> sorry, sometimes when you work from home, interruptions like this happen. This is my daughter, Elizabeth. She clearly wants to watch Odd Squad or something on her tablet, and that's not working. And so uh, it's very important when you work from home to have a defined workspace where you can shut things out, and uh, preferably an office with a door, and that the children understand that when the door is closed, daddy is working, not to be disturbed. So anyway, what was I saying? I was saying we all work from home, and there is no main office. So it's not like I'm remote, and then everyone else is in an office somewhere. We are all working from our home offices. There are 42 of us, roughly, scattered all around the world. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of people in Europe, one guy in South Africa, a few in Australia, and th those are roughly the locations of our, our North American people. Uh, we have a few in Canada. I like to make fun of the one that's in Nova Scotia, because even though he's in Canada, my house is technically north of his, so I call him a southerner. Um, we are distributed between 16 countries, and between us, we all speak 19 languages, which can make support a lot more, uh, support for a worldwide product a lot easier, because uh, if we have someone, a customer, who's more comfortable speaking in a given language, we probably, likely, have someone who can do that. The other really nice thing about, be distributing all, about being distributed all over the world is when it comes to support. So we have a product to support, and we have 24-hour support for it, which means you know, all of us are going to have to carry a pager, or well, what it really means is pager duty on our phones. But um, in a previous company, which was headquartered just in Minnesota, I shared pager duty with like five, four other developers. And so I would go two weeks on and then eight weeks off. And that was OK. I mean, it's never fun to be woken up in the middle of the night, but at least you, know, you had those eight weeks off where you didn't have to worry about it. Well, then one developer left, and so we were down to four. So it was two weeks on and six weeks off. And the guy who left, all of his responsibilities went on to the next guy. So then he decided he was going to leave, too. Pretty soon, it was down to two developers, and I was two weeks on, two weeks off, at the same time that my daughter was about seven months old. And that was just not very fun for me. So now that I work in a company where we're distributed all over the world, we can divide up those support responsibilities into regions. And we generally call these time zones, even though that's not really true. We just kind of group them into the North American, European, and uh, uh, Australia zones. And so when I'm on call, and I was actually on secondary call this week, I'm only on duty for eight hours from roughly, uh, I don't know, maybe 9 or 10 o'clock to maybe 7 p.m. And so most of it is within my working hours anyway. Um, it's a little later because it's, it's designed so that in LA it doesn't start at like 5 a.m. or something like that. Uh, so it goes a little bit into my evening, but no big deal. Our support structure is also structured so that um, we only get interrupted for these kind of things with truly critical cases where the customer is expecting a five hour or one hour SLA. So generally these only happen one or two times a month. And so I'm not sure that there's ever been a time when I've actually been interrupted in my day by a support case that would have like messed up my day. Now the counter to this is you also have to worry about what I call the tyranny of the sun. And I believe that's from a video game that I haven't played. But I heard another uh, remote worker use that phrase. And I liked it, so I decided to keep it. Uh, basically, there is always something happening. It's kind of like our company is the British Empire of a few centuries ago. The sun never sets on particular software. There's always someone awake, always someone probably doing things, except for Saturday when we do take some time off, thank goodness, because we all need that. Um, it's also a little different because we have a lot of coworkers in Israel, and Israel works Sunday to Thursday, and their weekend is Friday and Saturday. So that means even on Sunday, stuff is coming in. And that means you have to be really good about triaging your notifications. Uh, that's kind of an OK day, but you know it's just as easy to wake up in the morning and have it look like that instead. So triage starts for me first thing in the morning when I'm letting the dog out. 
because you know, she takes like five minutes to do her thing, so why not sit on my phone and go, not important, not important, not important. Ooh, that's important, I'll do that later. <clears throat> you also need to be ruthless about unsubscribing and unwatching things from GitHub. People will ping you and go, hey, group, what do you think? And you're like, I really didn't need to be subscribed to that issue in perpetuity. I need to unsubscribe from that. And as far as watching repositories, uh, I don't think there's any repositories that I actually watch because I don't need to be subscribed to every issue in that repo by default. You also need to learn how to use the do not disturb feature on your phone. Does anyone, does anyone else use the do not disturb feature? Yeah? Um, so absolutely critical when you work for a global remote organization. So from 10.30 p.m. to 7 a.m., my phone will not buzz at all, I think unless my mom calls me, because that's probably an emergency. Um, I also learned very early not to sneak a peek at the phone. Like if you have to wake up because the kid woke you up, do not look at that phone, because you know it will have 20, 20 notifications on it. And if you start looking at any of them at 3 a.m., your brain will wake up, and all of a sudden you're gonna be up for the day. So, Better to leave that thing on the nightstand, don't touch it, go back to bed, get your sleep, it's important, you need it. So the fact that we're spread around the world isn't the only thing that makes our company unique from other companies that have remote work policies. And I like to use this TV as kind of a metaphor for that. Has that did anyone ever have a TV kind of like this when they were growing up? I did, my, my parents, well, my parents did. You know, I just remember them watching Wheel of Fortune on it and that was my mom's favorite, and MASH was my dad's favorite. And it was my job to get up off the couch, go to the TV, and change the channel or change the volume basically whenever they said. And when I was like, why do I have to do that? And they go, why do you think we had kids? I mean, the problem with this TV is that it is not, not built for a remote. And that's the problem with a lot of companies too. They say, oh yeah, it would be great to have a remote work policy, maybe one or two days a week. It'll be great for recruitment. We can use it for this and this and this, but they're not really built to support it. They're still anchored in the past in all of these ways that are not remote friendly and that causes friction. It's kind of like the Friends episode where Rachel's boss and coworker smoke and go outside to smoke and they make all the decisions outside while she's cut out, and so she's tempted to go smoke with them, and then the, the coworker that is the one that gets to go on the Paris trip or something like that. That's what a lot of companies that say they're remote friendly turn into. All of the hallway conversations, all of the important stuff happens at the office, and if you are remote, you kind of get left out of all of that. Decisions get made in meetings that aren't broadcast or recorded or, or teleconferenced, and you're left out in the cold which is really stupid, since most companies should really be built for remote. Uh, this tweet says, as soon as you have more than one office, you're technically, I put it in that word, a remote company, whether or not you actually do remote. If you ever have to do a video call with another team member, you are remote. And yet companies still are like blind to the fact that they're making it absolutely as hard as possible to do that. And so how do we build our company to be remote first? First of all, we have no data center, unless you count Azure or AWS. We have no office, so we have no group of servers in that office. We have no internal networks either, which means we have no need for a VPN, or at least a VPN like most companies would think of it. We do have VPN software. It's for our own safety when we're connecting from a coffee shop so that our signal can't get, get uh, uh, stolen by someone else. But there's no need to say, okay, I need to work from home, so first I have to connect to the company VPN so that I have access to all the stuff I need. It just creates a barrier and makes remote workers a second class citizen. <laughs> Basically, we can work wherever there is Wi-Fi. And I have worked in a coffee shop, I have worked in a Panera. Um, I, I don't like to do it often because you know I have three big gorgeous screens in my home office and when I'm in a coffee shop I have just a little laptop screen and that's no fun. But it's possible. In fact, one of our staff members kind of took that to the extreme. His name is Adam Ralph. He's from Switzerland. He's kind of somewhat famous for being the per first person to have a community pull request merged into the .NET Core, into, into .NET Core when it was open sourced. I think he uh, actually kind of screwed up Microsoft's presentation because they were planning to do it, and then they went, oh, look, we have this PR. Um, 
But he has taken remote work to a new level because he and his girlfriend bought a van and they have been traveling around Europe with it. And Adam works out of the van and uh, goes and speaks at a bunch of conferences and stuff like that. And in fact, if you remember this picture, if we zoom in, there's Adam in his van. It's very grainy, but that's, that's his van. And so, uh, also when Adam is traveling around Europe, I'm sure he also takes some time to see the sites. And this is also one of the great things about particular software. We have, it's not really an unlimited PTO policy, but when you have, when you have employees in like a whole bunch of countries, there's really no way to have a standardized PTO policy. So we make it really simple. It's not really an unlimited PTO. It's more like, um, I mean, if you've heard about unlimited PTO policies and some of the dangers with them, where some companies will roll out unlimited PTO and, and it's really kind of a backhanded, you know, you need to work more kind of a thing, like they pressure you into working more and against taking time off. Our company is, isn't like that. We have more of a minimum required PTO policy. So every quarter we get an email like this that says, hi everyone, it's approaching the end of the quarter, so it's a good time to check in and see if you've taken the minimum amount of vacation for the year yet. Please put your initials on, by your name on this worksheet if you have. And so we go to this worksheet in Google Sheets and we put our initials on there, assuming we've taken at the very minimum 10 business days and five of them consecutively. But we do not pressure people to work more than we think they should. Um, you know, we have colleagues in Europe where taking four weeks off in like July is a very common practice and there's no problem with that. The big thing is we're all responsible. That's one of our core values and so we trust you to do the right thing. So, those are some of the principles needed to be remote first, but what about our tools? It turns out it's not just the tools you use in order to be a remote first company, but it matters quite a bit how you use them. And so I'll take you through some of the tools that enable us to be a remote first company. First, of course, is GitHub. We do everything in GitHub. Almost everything in our company is a GitHub issue. And then there's Slack, which we use for communication between ourselves. This replaces the hallways that we don't have and meeting rooms. And then we have Zoom for recording meetings. And we record every meeting, pretty much. Um, or, or at least we say we do, sometimes we forget. Uh, and we post them on Google Drive. So, some more tools. We, we have Gmail and the whole G Suite, but honestly, we don't use email that much. In fact, the only time I really use email through Gmail is when I am communicating with an outside customer. For all our internal stuff, it's either on Slack or on a GitHub issue. We have Salesforce for CRM and managing customers and all that sort of stuff. I'm not a big fan of Salesforce, but it's kind of a necessary evil. We have Expensify for reporting our expenses. We have pager duty, like I mentioned, for our support duties. Uh, we have Team City and Octopus Deploy, which is how we do our builds and releases. We have MyGet, so all of our packages, because at, at the end of the day, most of our stuff is a NuGet package, so we stage it on MyGet before pushing it to NuGet. <clears throat> we have Raygun, which helps for error reporting. We have Waffle.io which is kind of a project management Kanban board on top of GitHub issues. We have LastPass because it's very important when you are a remote company that everyone has good security practices and has unique passwords for stuff and you know, isn't putting one, two, three, four, five or password one as a password for everything. Now, one thing you might mention about all those tools is that, that by and large, they're all SaaS tools. Software as a service. We, don't, we didn't install anything in our data center. The only uh, exceptions to that are really Team City and Octopus Deploy because you really, they really can't be deployed SaaS. So we have those um, in AWS. But all those tools are mostly SaaS and some are more important than others. And you might notice that three of them are bigger than everything else. And those are because those are our core collaboration tools. Uh, I heard another speaker yesterday say, computers are, are easy, people are hard. That's true, and so these tools are the tools we use to communicate, which is some of the most difficult work that we do. First up is GitHub. Everything is in GitHub. Our code is in GitHub. We have private repos where we have documented our processes, 
And so if someone was like, you know what, I think the whole PTO policy is garbage. I think we should change it. How they would do it would be to submit a pull request against that policy in GitHub. Um, so even our non-technical users, our non-technical people use GitHub. And non-technical is pretty much a misnomer because they're pretty technical, they're pretty awesome. But I mean non-engineers, non-coders. Everyone uses GitHub. And it's actually pretty amazing to watch someone who uh, probably when they went to university was not expecting to be a technical person merging a pull request against something in GitHub. It's pretty cool to see. We have 138 reposit repositories, uh, 20 more in a particular labs or organization, 45 people, 66 teams. You might notice 45 people in 66 teams. How does that work? Well, we have maintainer groups. So uh, different repositories like say Azure or RabbitMQ will have a maintainer group and many of us are a member of multiple maintainer groups. So that's why there's significantly more teams than there are people. Um, so like some of our issue stats around April 16th, we had nearly 2,400 open issues. So we have a ton of ideas of stuff we want to do. Um, nearly 16,000 closed issues, just a bunch of stuff, everything's in GitHub. Next up is Slack. Who uses Slack here or has used Slack? Okay, most of you. <clears throat> we have 147 public channels. Uh, private channels are almost non-existent. We do almost all of our conversation out in the open. Um, now there have been some uh, articles about how Slack is the worst thing ever and some of those are focused on like the performance of the app and that's one thing. But others are focused on like the level of annoyance or, or, or basically people's manners, I guess, is what it really boils down to. And so we have a lot of rules to make Slack uh, as useful and uh, not annoying as possible. For instance, there's a general channel in Slack that everyone has to be a member of. We renamed that to announcements, and we have very specific rules about the announcements channel. You don't ping anyone in the announcements channel. Um, just because you're saying something happened doesn't mean I need to be woken up in the or, or interrupted in my dinner to read that. So. No pings in the announcements channel, which everyone has to be in. Uh, we have an RFCs channel where when we're going to make a significant change, we RFC it in the RFC channel, pointing to the GitHub issue, to say, hey, this change is gonna happen. Is there anyone who has input on this before we make it official? <clears throat> we have a high fives channel where we are uh, basically giving each other props because we're all disconnected, we're all not sitting next to each other, and so to build a sense of team, we all give each other props through the high fives channel and celebrate our successes there. Um, we discourage the use of the at channel almost everywhere. There's got to be a, a better, more focused subset of people that are really need to be interested in something, and so we have, like all of our maintainer groups also have a Slack alias, um, and so at channel, almost a, a do not a do. Not do. Uh, we have lots of custom emoji because they're fun, but uh, we have really cut down on the number of Slack autoresponders. Uh, we had one for like works on my machine that would like pop up a funny GIF that was like this big and that eventually got really annoying to like every time it, it works on my machine, boom, this thing pops up. Almost all of those are gone. We only have useful ones for like find admins, which replies with the link in GitHub to where all the admins are. Moving on to Zoom. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, Zoom is a teleconferencing, video conferencing software. It's very good about recording things. Uh, we can have meetings with customers and customers can have a call in number so that they don't have to install the client. And then assuming the customer consents, we can also record that call. And so if there's any support stuff that comes out of that, then, uh, then that can be recorded and referred back to. <clears throat> We record just about every meeting and we post it on Google Drive, especially company-wide meetings like our town halls and uh, we have a, a meeting where we basically get to challenge the CEO or challenge the company, challenge something that's going on in the company and say, I don't think that's right, let's discuss it. Um, uh, another important tool that I didn't mention earlier relating to meetings, there is a Chrome plugin called Video Speed Controller and so I am very used to listening to uh, my coworkers talk at about 1.4 or 1.5x. Uh, and it's really interesting. Some people's accents, very easy to speed up. Some people's accents, oh, you gotta back that off. Um, but being able to listen to an hour meeting in about 45 minutes is really useful. 
And so when you take these three primary collaboration tools and kind of put them on a spectrum, it's very interesting that each one has different strengths and weaknesses that in order to work effectively, we need to use. And so, for instance, GitHub is 100% async, where Slack is kind of a blended sync async, because some people may be there paying attention to it, but other people might not even notice it until the next day, where Zoom is face-to-face -face synchronous communication you're having it right now. GitHub is a permanent record where Slack is searchable but fleeting. I mean, we have, we have the, the, the account that stores our history forever, but at some point you're like, oh, where did we talk about that? And finding it in Slack can be a bit of a challenge. If you want something on the permanent record, it needs to go in GitHub, where Zoom is totally opaque. You can't really just say, oh yeah, we discussed that in this two hour meeting, go watch the whole thing. That's a really mean thing to say. If something actionable comes out of a meeting, you need to record it in text in a more permanent format on GitHub. And so GitHub is where decisions are recorded, Slack is where decisions are discussed, and Zoom is also where decisions are discussed, but mostly when it's more complex and not as easy. Um, GitHub is very impersonal. Uh, Slack is a mixed bag, and Zoom has the advantage that you can rely on nonverbal cues and that face-to-face -face communication. And so it's really important that we at all times think, you know what, we are abusing this medium. We have if we've gotten this far, this many lines in Slack, maybe we should get a face-to-face -face meeting so we can actually sort this out. Really important to know when to escalate to a different collaboration medium. Now, the most um, kind of interesting or different thing about our company isn't really the fact that we're all remote. Eventually, like when I tell people about this, they can kind of figure that out, and okay, it's weird that you work from home, but okay, I guess that could work. What's really surprising is that we are a completely flat organization. We have no chains of command or anything like that. And when I tell people this, most of the time they're like, what? How does that work? At least the McAllisters had some structure, at least the parents were in charge of the children. But we don't have any managers, so how do you get everyone to work together with everyone at home kind of doing their, their own thing? In fact, at the beginning of this experiment, because the company used to be structured with like an engineering department and a marketing department and stuff like that, at the beginning of the experiment, where we said we're gonna have a flat organization, we simply asked everyone to work on whatever they thought would have the most impact. And that turned out to be awful. Because we're all really passionate and we're like, that's a good idea, I wanna do that, I'm gonna start that. And pretty soon, I'm working on like 15 things, and I don't really have time to finish any of them. So lots of things were getting started, but not a lot of things were getting done. So we decided to kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit and take some, um, take some inspiration from the product that we build. And so in Service Bus, I told you it was a messaging framework, and what it allows you to do is have all of these different services that are lightly coupled basically communicating by exchanging messages back and forth. And by the way, this is the very apex of my ability to do animation in PowerPoint. It will not get any better than this. Let's stop that. And so, in the same way that you can have different services that are lightly coupled, we decided it would be smart to experiment with having different areas of strategy. And so we have five areas of strategy in our company. The first one is platform development, and that is responsible for creating the platform, building the tools, taking, I mean, it's kind of like the engineering department reborn, but it's really broader than that. Um, then there's customer success. This is where support falls. This is where uh, sales falls, all of those sorts of processes. Basically, anytime there's like a one-to-one -one conversation with a customer, it's rooted in the customer success area of strategy. There's developer education, which I'm heavily involved in. Part of developer education is showing up at conferences and giving talks like this, uh, writing blog posts for our blog, uh, doing a lot of the marketing related stuff, uh, talking to developers, that kind of thing. And then staff success is making sure that all of the passionate, awesome people we have actually stick around. So uh, HR policies and all that sort of stuff goes into staff success. And then in the middle we have collaboration. How are we going to do all of these things and collaborate and work together with all the tools that we have? 
Those are the five main areas of strategy, but sometimes we say, you know what, we need to deliver this big project, and it has elements of all the areas of strategy. Um, for example, we've recently done projects where we've delivered new monitoring capabilities to our platform, or when we launch a brand new version uh, with .NET Core. And so when that happens, we organize kind of a quasi area of strategy called a launch wave. And so it'll have kind of representatives from all the different areas of strategy so that we can make sure that we are delivering for .NET Core and we're also doing the marketing and we're also doing the staff success to make sure that everyone is trained on all the new features for when they're talking to customers and all, all of that stuff all kind of rolled up in one. And so, like I said, we have 138 repositories. This is just an image of some of the public ones that I took two and a half years ago. I didn't want to remake the whole tag cloud, but there's a lot of them. But the important part is none of them are owned by any given area of strategy. And so that means that even though you would say, oh, all this is all technical stuff, so that's all owned by platform development, right? No. Platform development is not just the rebirth of the engineering department with no managers. Platform development is an area of strategy that can affect um, priority of things to work on. And so I was saying that everything is represented as a GitHub issue. And so here's the issue for me preparing my talk. And in this case, I was the only one assigned to it. Does it have the assignments on there? No. Uh, maybe. Um, in this case, I was the only person assigned, but that's usually not the case. So each issue in GitHub will ha have, first of all, a plan of attack, the things we're going to do to close the issue, basically a checkbox list of things. And then it'll also be staffed by a task force. And a task force is responsible for taking a task and bringing it to completion. They are, have full autonomy and authority for that task. There's no manager to report to or anything like that. Now that's, of course, assuming that good decision-making practices get used. So usually when we challenge something that a task force does, it's not that I think that's a bad idea, I think you're stupid or anything like that. It's did you RFC it? Did you use good decision-making practices? That kind of stuff. And that's a big important reason why we have the RFC process. So the task force can go, you know, we're recommending this, but we're not ultimately sure. Let's put it out there and see if we can get some comments back. Now, task forces are interdisciplinary. I mean, you got the, the smart guy and the, the bumbling idiot, right? Those are not the roles on our task forces, but we have like a facilitator and we can have in the same task force uh, a person to do the coding, a person to do the marketing, a person specifically designated from a maintainer group to be a reviewer for any of the PRs that come up. And so that blending of disciplines within the task force uh, ensures that the task force will be able to do their work with that full autonomy and authority. The uh, challenge is actually putting together those task forces and making sure you have the right skill sets before you get started. Uh, this is why we also have specialists and experts. So for instance, I'm a RavenDB expert. I've um, used RavenDB in the past. I'm a RavenDB maintainer. And so when there's something to do with RavenDB, I'm usually brought in as an expert to kind of consult with a task force, whether or not I'm in that task force. The other thing is that an issue should not be worked on unless it has been moved by the area of strategy into progress. Now this is big, this is how we keep from going, the, oh, that looks cool, I'll start that. And this is all done by a group of people called the squad. And so every single area of strategy has a squad of four or five people or so that basically manage that area of strategy and set priority for, for the issues that go through there. Um, the interesting thing is I, I said that no repository is really owned by any area of strategy. So for instance, developer education could say that in order to better reach out to developers, we need to make a technical change to the platform to enable some feature so that they will be able to do something easier. Just because it's developer education, that does not mean it's marketing reborn with no manager. It's just a body of of people that is focusing on specific metrics and can prioritize tasks anywhere in order to accomplish that mission. And so the squad will set priority and then their big consideration is, you know, we do have all of these great ideas and we want to do all of them, but we don't have a thousand people. So how are we going to do that? We have to decide what to do now and most of the time what to do later. I mean, sometimes it's easy to set priorities. I mean, uh, you really don't want to watch Home Alone 3, it's utter garbage. But when you're coming to picking between Home Alone 1 and 2, they're both good movies. I only have time to watch one. Which one should I watch? 
it can be really difficult. And so um, as we've been evolving, we've been starting to analyze that more and getting really into the question of why. Why does that area of strategy exist? Why are the reasons that we want to do things within that area of strategy? And so especially within platform development, we've started separating that out in, in even further. And we now have four why buckets, we're calling them for lack of a better term because naming is hard, um, that are also have many squads that are focused on specific reasons why we do platform development and prioritizing issues within them. And so within platform development, we have reacting to a shifting marketplace. The key tenet here is making sure our platform works on industry standard tools, platforms, and technology. So uh, Kafka has come out. We need to evaluate Kafka and see if that's something we should support transport for, stuff like that. We have keeping the, light, the lights on. The key tenet here is making sure our platform is stable and reliable. So this means making the documentation is uh, reviewed and updated regularly, making sure that the ownership of, a, uh, having the ownership of the patch process and the maintenance release process. We have developer experience or making it easier for our customers to be successful with the platform. The key tenet there is making sure our platform guides you towards success, removing the rough edges, making it easier to get started so that developers aren't turned off by, by some rough edge. And the last one is delivering business value. And this is basically, the key tenant here is making sure our platform provides the infrastructure for building and managing distributed systems. And so you remember I showed you how end service bus allows you to have different services all kind of doing their own thing. Another thing you can do because of that is then uh, it can be perfectly valid for marketing the marketing service to say my needs for data storage are essentially relational data and so I'm gonna use Microsoft SQL Server. But maybe shipping says, you know what? It would work better if all of my data was in a document database, so I can use MongoDB. Maybe another service could use a graph database. Um, in the same way, our different areas of strategy can, and our, the buckets within the platform de development strategy can use different tactics to kind of figure out what they need to do too. So for example, our reacting to a shifting marketplace bucket makes use of a tech radar. So uh, I'd love it if we would publish it someday, but we have an internal tech radar for basically every technology, and is it in the you know, hold, assess, adopt, retire, that kind, that kind of stuff. We're not perfect and we struggle, as I'm sure everyone does, but we're trying to constantly improve, unlike the Home Alone sequels. So they just got worse and worse as time went on. But you might be asking, with all that stuff going on, how do I, as a person sitting alone in my basement with the dog snoring on the couch, actually figure out what to work on right now? And for that, we have a label that strategies can add to issues that says needs task force. So after the squad makes sure that an issue is well-defined and has the proper skills defined and has an actual end state, they can add the needs task force label and people can use that to essentially shop for work. They can go and run a query on GitHub and go, oh yeah, that looks like something I could help with and sign up for that task force. Now it's still really important to keep yourself from being overloaded because you can sign up for too many task forces and then we have the exact same problem. Uh, and so we kind of have guidelines on how many task forces you should be assigned to. And we have a query that's actually very complex because GitHub doesn't make it easy to do ands or ors to look between all our repositories and say, these are the things that I am assigned to that are in progress that I should work on. So once that's all sorted out, every day I kind of have my to-do list. And I get that from that GitHub query that shows me the issues that are important, that are, that are assigned to me. And I also have things that come in on kind of an interruption basis. So I have support cases that come in and get assigned to me. And I have all that kind of stuff too. But I have that to-do list and basically each day I need to figure out kind of how to organize my day. And that's where it really comes into kind of the art of being a, a remote worker. Because you kind of have to figure out based on where you are and what needs to be done and where everyone else is, what should I do in what order? So for example, um, right now Europe is still working in their afternoon. They're still doing a lot of stuff, but they're about to sign off. So morning is when 
I need to be able, I need to do all, any collaboration I need to do with someone in Europe. Or if they're working on a task and I'm also on that task force, that's where we need to do handoffs so that I can keep working where they started. Um, that means there's a lot of activity for me in North America in the morning and then in the afternoon it tapers off significantly. So if I have some like, I really wanna get coding or you know, have like a three hour block of uninterrupted time, afternoon is a good time to kind of schedule that. And we will actually you know, schedule an appointment on our calendar that says working on X so that we're not disturbed. Uh, and so I go about my day. Um, but of course, working from home can get kind of lonely, especially when the weather's not good. Remember, sometimes I work here. Um, so the problem, the big problem with working remotely is you never get to, you hardly ever get to see the people you work with face to face. You never get to meet up and hatch grand plans to go change the world. Uh, you don't even get to meet up and uh, break bread together and have a meal. That's really important for the cohesiveness of a company. And so every once in a while, we, well, about every year, we all get on an airplane and we all go together and meet in some location. We have a week worth of meetings. And it would probably be in a hotel conference room. It would probably look something like this. Um, and we basically talk through like lots of stuff depending on the year. Um, everything from how our processes are working to what we're gonna work on in the next year to initiatives we have, uh, new launch waves to set up. And so that week long trip on an airplane often results in coming home and ha we have these aha moments. From coming together, we have these sparks of inspiration. And so when we, we, when we get done with one of those meetings, we come home and there's a, just a rush of work that happens and there's just a huge increase in engagement and vitality in the company, which is really cool to see, uh, which is good. You need that kind of kick in the pants every once in a while, especially when you're working from home to make sure that everyone's on the same page and aligned and going towards the same goals and all that. Because when that week is over, we all fly home and we're back home. And once again, we are home alone. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Um, if we need to terminate a, an employee, that's actually uh, also done by a task force uh, because of the sensitivity of that kind of situation. It's a task force that's done in secret that's uh, kind of arranged by the CEO. Um, as far as hiring capacity, we have processes and staff success that are like, what are our skills gaps? What do we need to hire for or train for or whatever? And so um, at the moment we're not hiring, but at, in the fall, I hope we actually will be. And so we'll be, you know, and it's not just skills. It's like what geographic location would be good? I mean, uh, we have a lot of customers in North America, so it would be nice to hire more staff in North America to, to cope with that. Uh, does that answer your question? My personal transition? Um, well, what about it? I mean, I didn't have many struggles with it personally. Um, I mean, I've, I've been using N Service Bus since 2010, but only working for the company for the past three years. So for me, it's kind of a, like this is my dream job, this is what I wanna do, whether or not it would be in an office or working from home. Um, I mean, I had, to, I had to learn how to deal with the notifications. That was the big thing because uh, before I never got emails except for when I was at work and that has changed drastically. And so just figuring out how to cope with that and unsubscribe and, and deal with all that so I don't feel flooded all the time. Um, some of my coworkers use, I think, Octobox so they don't have their GitHub notifications going directly to their email. They kind of ignore that when they're not working then Octobox gives them the the notifications when they, they are working, uh, but everyone kind of has their own strategy. Some people use uh, Google Inbox instead of Gmail so that you can like snooze an email. I think that feature is actually in Gmail now too. Um, and we have some, 
we have some recommendations in our in, in our repositories for our, our new employees to kind of to get them to, uh, to to help them figure that out without making all the same mistakes all the rest of us did. Um, but yeah, it's a struggle no matter what. We also uh, assign an onboarding buddy. So for your first six weeks or so, you're working closely with someone else who's already been in the company and they're showing you the ropes and um, checking in on you every day and making sure that everything is going okay. Any other question? Well, kind of a quick talk. I guess I talked too fast, but thank you very much for coming and have a great rest of your conference. <laughs>